Hi, everyone. I've given sermons and teachings in the past, and will continue to, including today's sermon, about how God is our Savior, and He does it by His grace and favor. Make sure you look at the sermons on grace and favor. I think you'll find some things interesting in there. And I gave a sermon on God's perfection, that it's God's perfection that He wants us to have, because anything we do, the best we can do, will fall short of the perfection of God. Become you therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. The word perfection usually has to mean uh, maturity, completeness. It doesn't necessarily mean the way we think of perfection as flawless, although in terms of God, He is flawless. But it means complete, completeness, completion, finished. Today I want to continue showing how our Savior is God. Our faith has to be in Him, not in what we ourselves can manage and uh, to come up with in terms of the righteousness that God requires for His kingdom. I mean, uh, God is our Savior. By God, I mean Father and Jesus Christ. They both together are our Savior. God so loved the world, He sent His Son. His Son was willing to take that and do that for us. Together, God is our Savior. I believe this teaching today is going to be one of the most important teachings that I've ever had. And I've spoken on it in the past, but it's been a while. So today I want to highlight a gift from God that I just don't hear sermons about anywhere. I just don't hear people giving a sermon on the gift of the topic today. God loves gifts. He loves giving us the gift of Jesus Christ, the gift of God's Holy Spirit, and the gifts within the Holy Spirit. He loves having the, the gift of salvation and so many more, the gift of His grace and the gospel, all of that's his gift. And then there's this gift, and we just don't hear much about it. It's the gift of, um, you know what, let's wait. A, no, I'll go ahead and talk about it. Let's go ahead and talk about it. And then we'll expound on this wonderful gift as we go through the sermon. Romans 5, 17, almost all my quotes will come from the New King James, unless I indicate it as New Living or NIV or New Century or, or whatever. But Romans 5, 17, in the New King James, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, that's Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. When was the last time you heard a sermon on the gift of righteousness? Will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. The NIV puts it this way. For if by the trespass of the one man, Adam, that's Adam they're talking about, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace, favor, and of the gift, the gift of righteousness. Not something we do, it's a gift. The gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. True righteousness is God's gift. It's not something we can ever come to on our own to equal the righteousness of God or to be good enough to be in the kingdom. Paul tells us his own righteousness according to the law, Philippians 3, 6. Maybe we'll show that even, Philippians 3, 6. 6 he says, concerning the law, blameless. And yet he also acknowledges in Romans 7 that even though he did the particular points of the law, he still failed sometimes. I still do the things which I hate. Romans 7 verses 14 to 20. He says it twice. But in Philippians 3, 9, he says he doesn't want, even though earlier Philippians 3, 6, he said as far as working out the points of the law, I, I was blameless. Philippians 3, 9 says, but I don't want that kind of righteousness that I did. I don't want it. I don't want the righteousness which is from the law, but the righteousness of God by faith through Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 9, we'll read it in detail later. So all my efforts, all your efforts, our efforts to be finally righteous enough that we finally can think in our minds that we've made it, we've qualified for the kingdom, you are missing the point if you're thinking that way. Paul didn't want his blameless own righteousness. Didn't want it. 
because it's denying a much higher perfection and righteousness, the perfect righteousness of God himself. Let's talk about that. Aren't we all very aware of how much, even with God's Spirit, we still do things that we really don't want to do? We still fail. I do too. I do too. Every minister out there still does. Don't think that because they preach the Word of God, they're better than you and are perfect in all their conduct and thoughts. No, they're not. We're not. You're not. The perfectness, the perfect righteousness of God Himself. Let's talk about that. And even with the God's Spirit, like I say, we still fall short. So the only real answer is to have faith in this perfect righteousness that God is gifting us. A gift is something you have to receive or you don't have it. A gift is not something you worked for or worked at. A gift is a gift. A gift is free. Working for something then requires that you are paid wages. Romans 4, 4 says that. But when something is just gifted to you, that's not wages. That's a gift. It's free. The same gift of righteousness is also referred to, as you'll see, as the righteousness which is by faith. The righteousness which is by faith. It's not by our works, but by, by our faith. That means believing, trusting, having faith in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11.7 talks about this righteousness, how Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith, according to faith. The NIV and the New Living Translation, the righteousness that comes by faith. He became an heir of the righteousness that is gifted to him, in other words. We love to recite how righteous Noah was, that he was a just man, perfect in all his ways, in all his generations, and that he walked with God. Romans 6, verses 7 to 9. And we forget that it is said right after God tells Noah in verses 6 and 7 of Genesis 6. When I say Romans, I meant Genesis. Genesis 6, verses 7 and 9. He said, I'm going to destroy all living things that are on the earth except those that are going to be in an ark that you're going to prepare because of the evil on the land. And then the very next verse, Romans 6, verses 7 to 9, I think it's verse 8 probably, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And yet this very same Noah got incredibly drunk, incredibly drunk after the flood. But he had the righteousness that comes by faith. God wasn't looking at his righteousness. God was looking at the righteousness he had. He found grace with God. He found favor with God. God extended his grace, and with that, he gave him the righteousness, according to Hebrews eleven seven, 7, that comes by faith. That's the same we need to have as well. <clears throat> now, whose righteousness is that? Have you received that gift from God? He's offering it. Have you ever even thought of God's perfect righteousness as something you have received? It's the righteousness you look at and that you acknowledge. So hello everyone, I'm Philip Shields, host of Light on the Rock. Thanks for coming, thanks for welcoming us into your home and I pray that you'll let others know about these sermons and blogs and also have video sermons, audio sermons and blogs. You can also go to the top of the homepage of lightontherock.org, hit the word videos or maybe we can show you as I'm speaking here. And all the videos will scroll down. I'll pause a minute as, I de as we demonstrate it. And then you can, and you can see all the sermons. Just keep scrolling down. All the sermons ever given under videos. I think we have like right now 75 or 80 video sermons. And then we have hundreds of audio sermons. It's just simply called sermons. Go to the top of the page again. See the word sermons. Hit that. Scroll down again and you'll find every single sermon I've ever given. If you keep scrolling, go to uh, page two or three or the following year or whatever, and then do the same with blogs. Blogs are short articles on hundreds of topics. And so learn to use the search bar and just type in one or two of the main words of a topic you're looking for. And you're, you'll probably see something on there. <clears throat> so back to the righteousness which is by faith. 
This will be a two-part sermon. This one here is really understanding what that is. And then part two will be how we use it, how we receive it, how we use it in our daily lives. So, we know we have to be righteous. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. I'll try to post this verse up there. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let that sink in. If you're deemed unrighteous, you won't be there. And yet there were some who were called many times righteous in the Bible. But that was the best they could do humanly. It wasn't God's perfect righteousness. So when you read that the parents of John the Baptist were righteous, or that this one or that one was righteous, it was in the best they could do. They were trying to obey God. Nothing wrong with that. But it's not going to be good enough to be in the kingdom of God. There are two kinds of righteousness. Our own righteousness of keeping the law, that is righteous. I'm not saying anything wrong with it. It's just you can't rely on what you and I can do to be in God's kingdom. We can't test, trust that that's going to be good enough. So the two kinds is our own, and the other one is God's own perfect righteousness, which he will give to us by faith. Re remember when a righteous, I'm, I'm sorry, when a uh, ruler of the synagogue came to Jesus I'm reading Luke 18, 18, 19. Luke 18, verses 18 and 19, a certain ruler, a leader in the synagogue, uh, came to him and said, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one's good. No, not one. There's only one good, and that is God. Of course, Jesus being God also, remember the Word was God, John 1, 3. The Word was God. The Word was with God, and he was God. Um, so that means he also was good. Yes, he is good. God the Father is good. Jesus is good. No one else. No one else. Romans 2.13 does tell us that it's not the hearers of the law who will be declared righteous, justified, that's what that means, but the doers of the law are declared righteous and justified. A lot of people like to quote that. So i got to do the law so God will look at me as being righteous. He will look at you as being righteous, but not righteous enough no matter how good you, you become on your own efforts, and even with God's Spirit, as Paul says in Romans 7. Now Romans 3, now if you continue reading beyond Romans 2.13, read to the end of chapter 2, start reading chapter 3, and you come to the point in chapter 3 where Paul is saying, okay, the doers of the law are righteous, but the problem is, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, he says, that's great if you can't keep the law perfectly, but no one has been able to do it. We're posting the scriptures. Romans 2, 3, 12 to 10 to 12. Romans 3, 10 to 12. If I get my words and all that, all in, translate for me because I'm thinking ahead and all that. So Romans 2, 13, NIV says, those who obey the law are the ones declared righteous. Romans 3, verses 10 to 12, as it's written, there is none righteous. So he's saying, yeah, if you could keep it perfectly, perfectly, without ever, ever failing, you would be called righteous. The problem is no one can do it. Paul says, I can't, you can't. There is none righteous, no, not one, verse 10. Verse 11, there's none who understands. There's no, no one seeking after God. They've all turned aside. They have to altogether become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. So the hearers aren't justified, the doers are. But the problem is you guys trying to do it aren't, aren't doing it. You still fail once in a while. You can obey God's laws even most of the time. But that's not good enough for the kingdom of God. Just like the one I gave on perfection. We can have perfect conduct and behavior and thoughts for maybe a few hours, maybe a day, maybe a few days. But then it falls down again. If we're not perfectly keeping God's law 100% of the time, which we can't and we won't be, then we're not perfectly righteous. The best we can muster, in fact, God says, you know what, the best of your righteousness, I hate to be so blunt, but in the Hebrew, it, it, it actually is. It's to me like a bunch of used tampax, smelly rags, menstruous rags. Isaiah 64, verse 6, 
We're all like one who is unclean. This is out of the New English translation. And our so-called righteous acts are like a menstrual rag in your sight. So you want the best you can do? Do you see why Paul said, I don't want the best I can do? Even though I'm sure Paul did it much better than all of us do it, as far as keeping the law. So we need help. Remember even Job, whom God called blameless in Job chapter 1, by the time God was done dealing with him. Here's what Job says in Job 42, verse 5 and 6. I have heard of you. You know, I, I, I went to Bible school. I went to church class and all that. And my parents taught me. And all. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eye actually sees you. And when I see the real you and the perfect character you have, who you are, what you are, I'm not so great as I thought. Therefore, I abhor myself, Job 42, verse 5 and 6, and I repent in dust and ashes. I can't stand myself. So are you and I any better? So in Romans 3, 23, it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God wants to forgive our debt. He wants us to have his glory. And so... He shows us how. Romans 6, let's read it. Romans 6, verses 20 to 23. I'm going to read this out of the New Century Version. In the past, you were slaves to sin. Goodness did not control you. You did bad things. You did evil things. And now you're ashamed of them. Those things only bring death. But now you're free from sin and have become slaves of God. This brings you a life that's only for God. And this, is, this gives you life forever, eternal life. When people sin... They earn what sin pays, death. The wages of sin is death, is the way you might know, know it better from the King James. But when people sin, they earn what that sin pays, death. But God gives us a free gift, life forever, eternal life, in Christ Jesus our Lord. So even the most righteous among us would still fall short of the glory of God, as Romans 3, 23 said. All fall short. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Romans 6.23, God wants to gift us with eternal life. That's why we need this sermon today, that the best we can do falls short. Ours will always fall short. Okay, what is righteousness? What does it mean? Righteousness is, how would you finish the sentence? Righteousness is being right with God, aligned with him, in tune with him in line with him and what is right. Righteousness is like when we uh, associate it with the word justified. Whenever you read the word justified, this person is just, that means he's righteous, or he's justified, it means he, he has been made right, he's been declared righteous by God. That's what justified means. So justified, even when you justify your margins on something you're typing out or, or doing on a computer, and you want to justify those margins, it means you're making them all right, okay? Other synonyms similar to righteousness are virtuous, moral, good, just, blameless, upright. The righteousness I'm speaking of today, though righteousness of our own isn't bad, it's not good enough. What I'm talking about today is the righteousness by faith. The same thing as the righteousness of God. We have his righteousness and by faith in it. So let's explore some more scriptures. We read the one already. Let's put it up again. Hebrews 11, verse 7, that Noah became the heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith, by faith, which comes from faith. Noah combined his belief that God was telling him the truth with actually then doing it. Just, you know, James 2, verse 20 onward says that you can't claim to believe God. Even demons believe in God and tremble. We have to do better than that. When we believe, we have to prove our belief by what we do. I can believe it would be better for me to go to bed at 10 o'clock at night instead of 1 or 2, but unless I start doing it, I don't believe it enough, obviously. So the doing of it confirms what our belief really is, is what James says. But your salvation is God's gift, not something you can do, not something you can earn. In part 2, I'll explain much more clearly how all that works. <clears throat> So don't confuse rewards with salvation. 
that's the other big mistake people talk, uh, they read about how we're being judged now and God has his reward or his punishment. Don't confuse rewards with salvation. Salvation, being saved, is God's gift. Ephesians 2, verses 6 through 8. You're saved by grace, through faith, not of works, lest you boast. Not of works, lest you boast. You're saved by grace, by God's favor, through faith. So your reward, though, once we are saved, your reward is based on what we do. What you're, you're saved means you'll be in God's kingdom. You'll have eternal life. Reward is what will you be doing with that eternal life? What will you be doing with your salvation for eternity? And that has to do with reward. And that's based on what we do. That is based on what we do. It's not salvation, though. 1 Corinthians 3 goes into that a lot, that if we build on the foundation that's been laid in our spiritual life with wood and hay and straw, that will burn up when God tests it. If we build on it with precious stones and gold and silver, that will endure the test of fire. And we will have our reward, it says in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 to 15. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 to 15. The ones who built with precious stones will have a reward. They'll all be saved, even the ones who built with hay and stubble. They will all be saved. But the ones who built with hay and stubble, that will all be burned up when it's all tested. And though they will be saved, it goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 3, they will not have a reward. But they will be saved. You, you see what I'm saying here? We've got to understand that. Revelation 22, 12, Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. He's not talking about being saved there. He's not talking about eternal life there. He's talking about, well done. I'm going to give you five cities or two cities, or I'm going to have you be responsible in charge of this or that uh, because of hard work you did. We do have to work for our rewards, okay? I'll give you some other scriptures in the notes. We must also be overcomers. That doesn't mean salvation again. Salvation is a free gift. Once we receive it, though, God does want us to show our appreciation for that and overcome bad habits, overcome sinful uh, trends we have. All the way through Revelation 2 and 3 to the seven churches, he says, to him who overcomes, I'll do this and do that. To him who overcomes, I'll give a sermon soon on what it means to overcome and how we do it. And part two, I'm going, to max, I'm going to talk about how we maximize all of this about overcoming. But now God's word teaches, and I teach, that we're saved not, 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 not by what we do, but by what God does in our faith in God. We're saved by his grace. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. His favor. And it goes on in verse 10 to say four good works. You can't claim to be saved and continue in unrighteousness all your life, building nothing, continue having adultery or lying or breaking the Sabbath or having idols in your heart. or such a thing as idols of the heart. We'll talk about that sometime. You can't claim that God's really involved in your life and keep doing as a way of life everything that you did before. We can still stumble and we all do from time to time. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians 2 verses 6, 7, and 8. Okay. Excuse me a second. Yeah. Verses 8 to 10, I mean. For by grace, you, verse 6 also says you've been saved by uh, grace and faith. But verse 8, by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it's a gift. A gift, not something you work for, but a gift of God. Not of works, lest you can boast. How, look how much I've done, how much I've accomplished. And then verse 10, for we are his, wor his, his workmanship. He's working something in us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Start doing good things. But that's not going to save you. It's the result of being saved. You now want to demonstrate that salvation by good things. 
So understand this salvation, this eternal life is by faith and grace working together. Now let's read some more about the righteousness of God. It's also called the righteousness of faith. The word justified will pop up a lot. It just means declared righteous, seen as righteous by God, okay? The entire process of salvation always is God's work. Always, all of it, from start to finish. God the Father is the one who selects the bride of Christ. He is the one who calls us. He is the one who leads us to salvation. All of this is in Romans 2. He is the one who sends the comforter to us that we have that Holy Spirit alongside and lifts us up when we're feeling down. He promises to finish what he started in us. He's promised to give us the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 11 and 12, I think that is. Our part, my part, your part, is to trust him, believe in him, trust him, love him, our salvation starts and ends with faith, like Romans 1 says. Let's read it. Romans 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. The fact that Jesus died for me and was raised from the dead talks of the salvation. So the true gospel, the full gospel of the kingdom of God includes the king. It must include the door into it. He must include the shepherd of, of that flock. His way, he's the, the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God. It's the power of uh, Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, this gospel, the righteousness of God the righteousness of God, not you, you and my righteousness, is revealed from faith to faith. It starts with faith, ends with faith, and the just shall live by faith. Then you go to chapter 2 and verse 4. He says, don't despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering." Or do you, he says, despise those. Not knowing that it's God's goodness that leads you to repentance, God's goodness. He does the whole thing, folks. And then we get in tune with him and we start working in him and with him, letting Christ work in us. And then Romans 3, verses 10 to 12, nobody could keep the law perfectly. Nobody is perfectly good. Romans 3, 20, therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified or declared righteous in his sight. No matter how many deeds of the law you do that are perfectly well, even if, even to the level of Paul who said his deeds of the law, Philippians 3, 6 or 7, were blameless. Here, St. Paul says, by the deeds of the law, which his was blameless, he said, no flesh will be justified or declared righteous in his sight. For the, by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's why we have to have God's righteousness given to us as a gift, because we'll, we'll never attain it on our own. So now let's keep reading. Romans 3, 21 to 29. I think mine only goes to 22 here, though. But now the righteousness, Romans 3, 21, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, apart from the law, Apart from the law, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Christ to all and on all who believe. In the Berean literal Bible translation, it says, and this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ, to all who believe. And verse 21, remember, says the righteousness of God apart from the law. And it's to those who believe. It's not, this righteousness has nothing to do with us and our efforts to keep the law, apart from the law. Okay, that's Romans 3.21. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, 
being that might be Romans 3. I don't know if that's 6 or 3 there. Being justified or declared righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Okay, because of his forbearance, God has passed over our sins, our previously committed sins. And first and first John 1 says all our sins. Verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that we might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So we see this is God's righteousness by faith again. Uh, I think this should say Romans 3 in my notes. I'm going to try to, verses 23 to 28 because I was in Romans 3. Romans 3, 23 to 28 I've just read, okay? So it's not the righteousness from your own hard work and merit. Verse, Romans 3, 27, what is boasting then? Where is it? It's excluded. By what law of works? No, by the law of faith. Romans 3, 28. This is what I was looking for. Therefore, we conclude that a man is declared righteous, is justified by faith apart from, apart from the deeds of the law. You're declared righteous by having God's righteousness received by you in faith, apart from what you're doing on your own. We have such a hard time with that because we're a do-it-yourself kind of people. We'd rather earn our own salvation. We'd rather be our own savior. We'd rather earn our own right to the kingdom of God. And that's so wrong. It is so wrong. Where's boasting then? It's excluded. By what law of works? No, it's by law of faith. Romans 3, 28. Therefore we conclude a man's declared righteous, justified by faith, apart from the deeds of the law. Do I, verse 31, therefore make the law void? No, he says, no, of course, of course we establish the law. We need the law, so we know what sin is. It identifies sin. But keeping that law is not going to be good enough to get you into the kingdom of God. Did you hear me? Did you hear Paul? Apart from the deeds of the law? So we must be righteous, but it can't be our own. It has to be the righteousness of God living again through Christ in us perfectly this time. And when we fall and stumble, that's our own righteousness again that's falling and stumbling. God's righteousness will never fall. That's why Romans 7, I don't have this in my notes. I'll make a note here because that's why Paul says in Romans 7 verses 14 to 20 that I still do the things I hate, but it's no longer I who does it, but sin that dwells in me. I've never heard a sermon on that. It's no longer I who does it, but sin who dwells in me. The old flesh, the old nature, because now we have two natures. The nature that's the old carnal sinful flesh that hates God, that the heart's deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, we still have that nature. But now God's given us his nature, his divine nature, that who loves him, who wants to keep God's way, God's law, who wants to obey him. These both are in our hearts right now. One of these will prevail. The one that we give attention to, the one when we spend a lot more time in prayer, in Bible study, in seeking after God, in being on our knees, repenting of our sins, then the other side, the new nature will prevail. Galatians 5, the end of it, it's all about this. That we have to walk in the Spirit. But we still will fall. But it's no longer, Paul says, now when I sin, it's not me, but the old me. The new me is the new creation that's living side by side with that old one. That's what he's saying. So we must be righteous, but it can't be our own. Now let's continue reading Romans 4. How do we get this gift from God? Romans 4 now. Romans 4 verses 1 to 6. What then shall we say that Abraham our father, shall, shall we say Abraham our father is found according to the flesh? Because if he was justified, declared righteous by works, he'd have something to brag about and boast about. But what does scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God, Romans 4, verse 3 now, believed God and it was accounted to him. That's an accounting firm uh, word. It, it, it's an accounting uh, terminology that something is put in, credited to you in your account. It was accounted to him for righteousness when he believed. Verse 3, now to him who works the wages are not counted as grace but debt. Romans 4, verse 5, but to him who does not work, 
to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, no matter how ungodly they were, if they will believe in him. Some of you are hearing this from or reading it in notes from prisons around the world. No matter how bad you've been in the past, you can repent. You can accept Jesus as your Savior. And he will declare you righteous no matter how ungodly you've been. And I've been. For his faith is accounted for righteousness. God credits us. Abraham, when this was said of Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 6, is about 85 at this time, or 86. He was, he was 85 because he was 86 a chapter later when Ishmael was born. But in Genesis 15, he was 85. It's going to be 15 more years before God gives him the son of the promise. 15 more years. And it's already been 10 or 15 years since God started working with him. He's getting old. He has no children yet through Sarah. Romans 4 that we just read, verses 4 and 5 through the century version. When people work, their pay is not given as a gift, but as something earned. Romans 4, verse 4 and 5. Verse 5. People cannot do any work that will make them right with God. People cannot do any work that will make them right with God. So then they, then they must trust God, trust in him who makes even evil people right in his sight. God can make evil people, the ungodly, right in his sight. Then God accepts their faith and that makes them right with God. Boy, are you hearing that? So many times, I know I've sometimes gone over and over in my mind some evil things I've done in the past. Evil things. And you have too. God doesn't want us doing that. He's removed that. He's cut that off. And when we say, Father, I want your righteousness, say the words. I want to receive your perfect righteousness by faith. Now, when you receive something by faith, faith is the evidence of things not seen. So you're not going to see yourself being perfect just yet. You won't be totally perfect in our actions and in what we actually live and think and do and all of that until the resurrection, when this corruptible puts on incorruption. That's when, finally, we get to see the full evidence. Genesis 17, 17, Abraham now 99 years old. This is now 14 years later. But first, he still has no child. But let, let's go back to Genesis 15 first and read it. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one, Eleazar, shall not be your heir. Your servant born in your house is not going to be your heir. Heir but one who will come from your own body. Genesis 15, verse 4 and 5 and 6. One who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him, God brought him outside, said, look up towards heaven. Can you count the stars? Can you number them? So shall your descendants be. So far he has none. He has zero. He's already 85 in Genesis 15. At 86, he, he, he gets Ishmael. But here it's still 85. And he believed in Jehovah. He believed in the Lord. And he accounted it to him for righteousness. What did he do? What did Abraham do? That God would say he was counted to him for righteousness. What did he do? He believed. It's so hard to believe sometimes when we don't have the evidence right in front of us. Sure, once Isaac is crying as a baby... Now I can believe. No. Abraham believed before the evidence was there. The evidence of things not seen. Paul goes on in Romans 4 to tell us that God doesn't change. change. God is impartial. He's not going to give something to Abraham that he can't give to us. God, in Romans 4, goes on to say, will also credit you and me. Let's put up Romans 4, verses 19 to 25, as I'm saying all this. 
God will also credit you and me with his own righteousness. If we do what Abraham did and just believe what he tells us, what he promises. Romans 4, verses 19 to 25, and not being weak in faith, God's now told him you're going to have a baby. In Genesis 15, it was 85. Genesis 17, he's now 99. Abraham did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. He was 99 to be exact at this point. Or 99 and a half. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was past the age of having children, way past it. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Yet Genesis tells us that he actually chuckled in his heart. Someone this old, really? Genesis 17? He says, 17, 17, he laughs in his heart. Sarah laughed. They both laughed. This is crazy. I'm old. I can't have, I can't perform anymore. Let's be blunt. His body was dead. Sarah can't perform anymore. Her body was dead as far as having children. Being fully convinced, verse 21, that what God had promised, he was able to perform. He believed God. He had faith. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now the really good part. The really good part. Verse 23. Now it was not written just for him, for his sake alone, that it was that righteousness was imputed to him. It wasn't. Are you getting it? This is actually very exciting. Verse 24, but also for us. It shall be imputed, credited, given to us. What? Righteousness shall also be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, was raised up because of our justification. He was raised up to be our righteousness, to be our justification is what it's saying. Are you getting it? It wasn't just Abraham who was accounted righteous because he believed. Paul is saying here at the end of Romans 4 that that same rule applies to everybody. God is impartial. It doesn't make a rule for Abraham without applying it to all of us. No matter who we are, white, black, Asian, whatever we are, whatever we are, indigenous, whatever, we can have the righteousness of God as much as Abraham did. In fact, we're part of his, all the promises given to Abraham, given to us now too. It's in Galatians 3, verses 26 to 28. Are you ready now to humbly accept that you can never, never yourself attain to the righteousness that's good enough to call it the character of God, to call it the righteousness of God? You cannot, not by works. Romans 3.28. Remember we read that. Where is that? Romans 3.28. Therefore we conclude a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. God has to stamp his righteousness right into you, right into you, mold you into himself, make you into the very image of Christ, his very own righteousness, his very own character. It's not something you will attain by working hard at this and working hard at that. You will not. Romans 3, 28, you're not justified except by faith, apart from deeds of the law. Let me remind you again. Jesus, Yeshua said, no one's good, no one's righteous except God. Matthew 19, 17. Luke 18, 18 and 19. Jesus in us will lead us to live a, a, a righteous life. If Jesus is living in you and me, he will live the way he used to live, obediently, righteously inside of us. When we listen to him, when we listen to that part of the two natures we have, when we get in tune with the godly nature, do everything we can to block out, to starve out the old carnal fleshly nature. We'll be Christ doing it, though. It won't be us. We'll be Christ's righteousness. This is why Paul says so clearly in Philippians 3, verses 8 to 10, so clearly, 
Indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of everything, and count them as rubbish or dung, that I may gain Christ. And verse 9, Philippians 3, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. I don't want that. I want to be found in him, not with my own righteousness. Not by how hard I tried to do this and do that. Verse 9, the end of it, but that which is through faith in Christ, here it is, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Just like Romans 5.17 says. It goes on to say, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, that he will be resurrected in me this time, living in me the way he did before. Now the key to all this will be brought out in part two. I have a lot more to cover. I think I'll just wait till part two for this. Let me just say this, though. Jesus did pray in his high priestly prayer at the Last Supper. John 17, let's read that, verses 20 to 23. We must come together as one. Those who have God's Spirit. Those who are led by Spirit are children of God. We must come together. Romans 17, verses 20 to 23, I do not pray for these alone, but for all those who will believe in me through their word. All those who will come along later on because of them and what they write and so on. That's us. He's praying now about us. That they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. That they may be one in us, that the world may know and believe that you sent me. And the glory which you give me, I want to give to them. That they may be one, just as we are one. Verse 22, verse 23. I and them, you and me. He says it twice here. That they may be made perfect in one. In fact, I think he said it earlier. He wants us one. He doesn't want us all split up. Just fellowshipping each other. Not getting along. Not visiting each other's fellowships. He wants us to be one. He's allowed the splits. He's allowed believers to go all kinds of places. He's not marrying a bride that has a leg over here and an arm over there and, and uh, an ear over there, another ear over here. We'll have to come together as one somehow. And just as Eve was part of Adam's body, came out of Adam's body and became one in union with him, let the two of them become one, it says at the end of Genesis 2. In the same way, through God's Spirit, we become so united with Christ that we are called one with Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Just like a man having sex or making love to his wife or to any other woman becomes one with that person is what he says just a verse or two before. In the same way, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Okay, next time I'll show you what Jesus actually did so we don't have to be stewing and worrying that we're falling so far short of the glory of keeping God's law perfectly and all of that. By faith receive the righteousness of God apart from the deeds of the law. But we do receive it. Christ does come live in us. He does live in us again, righteously, perfectly. It's his doing. We're going to read Romans 8, verses 2 to 3 and 4. And we're going to read other places about what all that means. This union with Christ that makes the receiving, receiving all of this righteousness of God come together. So we'll explain and explore all that in part two. I want to end at this point. And we, with Christ in us, we must and we do fight sin. We do resist the devil. We do flee immorality and fornication and temptation. And we do win. We do overcome. I'm not saying now that we have this faith, we can just continue and do whatever we want. No, Christ, we have to let Christ live in us. Live perfectly, righteously in us. Follow him. But it's faith in him, his righteousness. Faith in God giving us that righteousness. So much more is coming in part two. Dear God in heaven, our heavenly Father, who is perfectly perfect, who is perfectly righteous, who is perfectly just, 
who is perfectly loving and kind, compassionate, long-suffering, all the fruit of the Spirit, really fruit of you. Oh, God in heaven, let us have faith in who you are. Let us have faith in your righteousness. Let us have faith to receive your righteousness and believe we have it. Quit stewing when we fall down, we repent when we fall down and do the things we hate. But our confidence is not in what we do anyway. Our confidence is in you and letting Christ grow in us. Just like John the Baptist said, I must decrease, he must increase. That's said for all of us. Dear Jesus, come into our heart. Come into our lives. Shine through our lives. Destroy evil strongholds that are in our life. Let us have your mind. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Transform us by the renewing of the mind. Let us follow you and keep you and worship you. We love you, Father. Help us understand how you are so much love. And Jesus, that you are so much love. We praise you. We thank you. Can't thank you enough. In Jesus' name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others. <music>